Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, please send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Be sure to cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, before we get into today's adventure of the Abbots... I do want to remind you to be sure and check out my wife and I's book, Tales of the Dim Night. It's a fun read with a lot of comedy, some great homages to uh, classic Golden Age superheroes, and a good family story as well. I think you'll enjoy it, and I'd encourage you to to get it at dimnight.com, where you can also read reviews of Tales of the Dim Night, as well as some interviews we've done uh, uh, with the book. So go to dimnight.com, or just put Tales of the Dim Night in the search box on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Let's get into today's adventure of the Abbots, the Blue Rocket Express. After all, traveling on a luxury train is very glamorous. But did you ever read one of those timetables where it says, Baggage car, note, does not carry corpse. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of the Abbots, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon as Pat and Gene Abbott, the nationally popular characters of detective fiction created by Francis Crane. NBC invites you to join Pat and Gene each week at this time for an exciting recorded adventure in romance and crime. Tonight's story, The Blue Rocket Express. And here is Gene Abbott to set the stage for our puzzle and murder. Pat's office is in San Francisco, but he'd been called to New York on a case, and in order to clear it up, we had to take the blue rocket from New York to Chicago for a quick one-day visit. And then we planned to take the rocket back to New York again. We'd checked our luggage through, and we were strolling into Grand Central Terminal. Jean. Yes, Pat? The train doesn't leave for 20 minutes. Why do you always drag me to trains nine years ahead of time? Now what are we supposed to do? Stand around the terminal twiddling our thumbs? Don't get excited, dear. They open the train a half hour early, see? Mm. Track 32. It's open already. So come on. Stop being a typical husband and get on the train. Oh, of all the silly things. Dragging me here so early that I... Oh, uh, you go ahead. Why? I need razor blades and cigarettes and uh, a couple of magazines I forgot to buy. Uh Uh-huh. We got here too early. (laughs) Well, you're lucky I brought you here so fast. You'd have forgotten about it. Okay, okay. Now, just stop being a typical wife and get on the train. I checked our space at the desk inside the gate and went into the lounge car. I just lit a cigarette when the only other passenger in the lounge, a, a small, bespectacled chap, nodded at me quite cheerfully. It's rather pleasant to board the train early, isn't it? Yes, yes, it, it's very comfortable. Are you going to Chicago or on to California? Uh, just to Chicago for the moment. Oh? My name's Duffield, Professor Ernest Duffield. Mine's Abbott, Dean Abbott. You at the University of Chicago, Professor? Hmm? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to California. I'm in the through car. Oh, well, how do they work that? I've always flown across. Well, you see, they switch the car off in Chicago and then hitch it on to the back of the El Dorado. That way, as they say in the ads, you don't have to change trains. (laughs) What do you uh, teach, Professor? Well, I'm not teaching anymore, Mrs. Abbott. I'm doing research. Oh. Matter of fact, that's why I'm going to Los Angeles to a conference. And um, what's your subject? Bacterial warfare. Oh, I hate those words. Thank heavens no one's tried that yet. Oh, but they have. That sounds horrible. What um, is this conference in California? I'm very sorry indeed, but I cannot discuss that. It would be classified information. Now, if you'll excuse me... Oh, please, please don't go. My husband would love to meet you. Well, I'd be delighted to meet him too, but I'm... Well, uh, sort of an old eccentric, I guess you might say. I, 
I can't stand crowds. The moment the train fills up, I prefer retiring to my compartment until the end of the trip. I'm alone. I can relax, read. Goodbye, Professor. It's been most interesting. Thank you, Mrs. Abbott. Good evening. Well, well, leaving us so soon, friend. My name is Charlie Drake. Stick around, friend. I have a few stories you'll like. I I, I beg your pardon. (laughs) Get him. He ain't square. He's oblong. How about you, ma'am? I guess we might as well be friends. We're fellow travelers in the old shoot. Two Drakes, the name Charlie Drake. I'm the original good time Charlie. Uh-huh. Are uh, you uh, <clears throat> traveling alone, honey? Just a small-town girl at the mercy of all the traveling salesmen? No, no, no. I'm uh, with my husband. Oh, <clears throat> well, that ties it. In fact, here he comes. Well, I got everything I needed, Jean. Uh, Pat, uh, this hmm? is Charlie Drake, my husband. Oh, oh I, I look, house for all of us whipping up a little bridge game. Uh, let's see, there's three of us here. Who's who's that fellow over there in the corner? Anybody know him? The, the old geezer? No, we don't. Uh, what do you say there, stranger? How about for being a fourth at bridge? Eh? Oh, foxy grandpa, a little on the deaf side, hmm? Huh? Well, I can always keep the folks happy. Uh, I don't believe I caught your name. I'm Pat Abbott. This is my wife, Jean. Going a little old Chicago, are you? So am I. I'd love to be on that through car to sunny California, but business forbids. You got nice accommodations? Yes, yes, we're uh, quite happy about it. Well, look, I'm in car 181, compartment C. Open day and night, never a dull moment. Anytime you're feeling blue, you want a few laughs, call on your friend, good friend Charlie. Hey, have you two heard the one about the nearsighted octopus in the bagpipes? Have you? You'll bust your buttons, kid. This one's a real knee slapper. Now, listen here. It seems the octopus went to a... Pullman conductor, sir. Urgent telegram for Professor Duffield. Oh, it's all right. Just a moment. Find the light. And my bathrobe. Yes? Shut up, Professor. Get back into your compartment. What are you doing with that gun? Who are you? What do you want? You're bringing something to that California conference, Professor. It's a culture. Little germs in a flask. I don't know what you're talking about. Now, don't stall. There's no time. I know all about it. You've made a discovery. It's the most powerful bacterial weapon ever devised. The easiest to make, too. Quickest, cheapest. Now, where is it? Where's the flask? Get out of here. I want the flask, Professor, and right now. Be smart and turn it over. Who are you? Well, I guess you'd call me a salesman. I pick up little items like yours and then put them on the open market. Sell them to the highest bidder. You'd be surprised how these items draw customers. In America, Mexico City, Cairo, Berlin. I get around. I do very nicely. Now, where's the flask? Stay away from there. Is it in the medicine cabinet? Hmm? All I have to do is shout. The conductor you will come. You open your mouth and I'll put half a dozen bullets into that celebrated brain of yours. The flask in one of your valises? I'm going to give you five seconds to get out of this compartment. The flask is top secret property of the United States government. You must be out of your mind trying to get away with a thing like this. I've done pretty well before, and I talk up, Professor. Where the devil is that culture? I said I'd wait five seconds. You've about used them up. You don't really want to die, do you, Professor? You have so much to contribute to America. Why get yourself knocked off? Don't you have a family, Professor? Friends? Don't you want to go on living? Professor, you're just begging to be killed, and I'm just the guy to do it. You know, I, uh, I could even make it worth your while, Professor. I'll get lots of dough for the flask. Maybe I could cut you in for a piece. Now, where is the blasted culture, Professor? Don't touch that bell. Don't. Keep your hands off that bell or I'll crack your head open with this gun. So help me out. After Pat and I left the lounge, we didn't see the professor or Good Time Charlie for the rest of the trip. We left the train at Chicago without knowing there was anything wrong. Neither did anybody else. Pat tended to his business and then took a relaxing spin on Lakeshore Drive in a cab. And by early evening, we were back on the return trip of the Blue Rocket Express heading for New York. After dinner in our compartment... (laughs) 
Pat, I've been wondering. This is car 181, compartment C. Now, where did I hear that before? From that big boar, Charlie. He said this was his compartment on the way to Chicago. Oh, I'm awfully tired, darling. I think I'll hit the hay. Well, I'm wide awake. Night owl Jean, they call me. Okay. Then you go on up to the lounge. I'm going to ring for the porter and have him make up the berths. I'm knocked out. Well, thank goodness we lost good time Charlie. I was afraid we'd run into him again. Or when we got off in Chicago. Yeah. Let's come in. Oh, Porter, uh, make up our berths, please. Thank you. Oh, I'll step out of your way, Porter, if you can pull down that upper. Pat, look. That... There's, just, there's a body up there. Yes, a dead body. Oh, Pat. Get the conductor, please, Porter. Oh, someone did quite a job on him. Well, it, it's Professor Duffield. What? Who's he? Well, I, I met him in the lounge car when we were leaving New York before you got here. He's a scientist and expert on bacteriological warfare. Well, that makes it worse, much worse. You better have the conductor notify the FBI immediately. But, but this wasn't his compartment. What was he doing in here? The reporter tells me someone's died in here. Uh, yes, conductor. When he lowered the berth a moment ago, we found this body. Uh, what are your names? Mr. and Mrs. Patrick Abbott. All right. I'll find another space for you. Now, don't discuss this with anyone under any circumstances, except the police. I'll have them aboard on it our next stop. Now, we'll take care of everything now. Just keep calm and keep quiet. Don't go to sleep in the space I give you until I've had a chance to get more information well, from the, you. This man, the, the dead man, was in the wrong compartment. It, oh, what do you mean? Well, I met him on the way to Chicago on this train last night. If he was murdered and... And then his body was shoved into the upper berth and left sealed there. This is not the compartment he had for himself. His name is Professor Duffield. He was originally on the through car to California. He was in highly classified government work, Conductor. You better report that instantly when you contact the police. Now, my schedule book says the man who occupied this space on our trip out was a Mr. Charles Drake. Now, Conductor, my wife wouldn't make a mistake. Besides, Charlie Drake of... Good time, Charlie, as he called himself, got off in Chicago. This is not Drake. Uh, look, would you do something for me? Oh, what is it? Here are my credentials. I'm a private investigator. The New York police will know my name if you want to check. So will the FBI and the Pentagon. I've been on cases involving classified material. Well, you tell all this to the police, Abbott. I'm just a conductor trying to get a train all into right, New York. All right, now this train is a radio phone. So has the El Dorado. And time may be terribly important. Would you let me call them? Well, what for? I want to ask them if Professor Duffield is aboard. Well, he's lying there dead, isn't he? Look, just let me make the call. I have a theory. There's a phone in the diesel cab of the Eldorado. I read about it in the magazine. No, no, I can't, can't let people play games now, Mr. Rabbit. I have to see if there's a doctor aboard. I have to contact the police at the next town. Well, I, just I, the I... one call. I have the right to do that, don't I? Look, I can't get away, can I? You can listen to the conversation if you like. Uh, I'm telling you this may mean the solution of the case. Uh, Okay, make your call. There's two cars ahead. Thanks. Come on, Gene. Where are we, Conductor? And uh, what time is it? Approaching Manfield, Ohio. It's uh, 8.55. Mm -hmm. Mobile operator. This is RY64372. I want BX-6-500. Oh, you think you'll get through, Pat? Probably. I've got to ask him this question. I don't get it. Professor Duffield's dead in compartment C, and and, and then you're calling uh, to ask... Eldorado, this is Patrick Abbott. I'm a private detective. Aboard the streamliner Blue Rocket. Do what? Okay, get on, Conductor. Oh, uh, hello, Eldorado. This is John L. McLeod, Conductor aboard 15. Yes. Yes, it's all right. I understand. Yes. Uh, what's your question, Abbott? Do they have a Professor Ernest Duffield aboard? Passenger for Union Station, Los Angeles. In a compartment on the through car. Uh, Duffield for L.A. in the through car. Got a passenger of that description? Well? Well, what's the answer? Yes. Are you certain? He is? Thank you. Goodbye. What'd they say? They have a Professor Duffield. He's fine, enjoying the trip. Of all the ridiculous gags to Well, that's pull. impossible. The dead man is the Professor. All right. The police will take over shortly. We'll find out all the answers. They're getting aboard at the next stop two or three minutes now. Uh, 
you said you'd find another space for us. Yes, yes, I'll try. Now, uh, please, please, you wait here. I'll, I'll be back shortly. All right. That's good. This is just what I wanted. What are you going to do? Follow me to the door. But now, Dad, never you... mind. The conductor has been so nice, I wouldn't want to spoil a beautiful friendship. Now, this train is slowing down. Just stand here. I'll get these latches open on this door. Now, in about ten seconds, as the train slows down some more, you jump. What? Just fall easy. You'll tumble on the ground a bit, that's all. Well, you can't skip out now. We're in the middle of nowhere. You'll, you'll be a... You'll we need every out. second, dear. Without any interference. Are you ready? Well, the train's going too fast. I'm now not... jump! Gonna... We were lucky. We landed on soft ground. Oh, thank goodness the train wasn't going quickly. It was very dark. We were in deep grass somewhere in the middle of Ohio. No lights anywhere. Nothing. Now, let's see if we can... If we can what, my dear crazy Mr. Abbott? Exactly how do we solve a murder case involving a top-flight scientist by roaming around here by the railroad track? Dear, this is Mansfield. I saw on the timetable that the El Dorado is due at La Junta, Colorado, about 5.40 in the morning. Now, if we can find a road and get a hitch and grab a plane... Yes, if... Look, look. Through the grass. There's a paved road way up there. I saw a headlight. Come on. Let's try for that hitch. Hurry, Jean. We got the hitch in an old Model T. A very friendly farmer picked us up and told us it was a small airport about 15 miles away. A young veteran was operating a cargo plane service out of it. We bounced along the 15 miles in the old Lizzie, rattling like the famous skeletons on a tin roof. At the airport, we met the veteran. We thought we'd have trouble, but he was an eager kid, and the idea of trying to catch the El Dorado appealed to him. We stepped into his plane. Yeah, I, I think we can do it, Mr. Abbott. Where do you figure on landing? Well, that would be up to you, of course. Oh? Uh -huh. But I'd like to pick them up somewhere on La Junta. If not... Perhaps we might catch them in New Mexico. Okay, now, you keep the timetable of the El Dorado in front of me, and I'll head for the hunter. Well, isn't that country out there pretty rugged? Yes, ma'am. Cliffs, hilly, rough terrain. Well, can you make a landing out there where we can walk away from? Ma'am, I used to fly over a spot called the Hump back in the war. From a Sam to come in, you can fly over that. Anything else is a vacation with pay. Oh, fine. That's a help. It's all we need. A real soupy storm. Now, we've got to get through. Cross your fingers. I'm taking off. Uh, only by the way. Yes? There aren't any parachutes. We took off. Pat and I squatted on bucket seats in the back. The weather was awful. The little plane rocked, rolled, and practically stood still in midair. Time was passing. Precious time. Yes, Jean? How do you fellas do it? Do what? Just sit there, quiet-like, as if you were on a pleasure jaunt. Me? <laughs> I've bitten what's left of my nails. I've recited pertinent excerpts from a book I read called How to Keep Calm in a Crisis. <laughs> well, just relax. There's work to be done. Oh, yes, you always say that. But you have ice water in your veins. You're the rugged type. <laughs> Me, I'm the delicate, scare real easy type. Uh, it's none of my business, Mr. Abbott. Kind of silly to ask now, but... Are you 100% certain this trip was necessary? Why, why couldn't you have left it to the police where the train stopped? Because I'm after that train. By the time I convinced the authorities about who I am, what I suspected, what was going on, and fought through the right channels to the right authorities, it'll be all over. But really over. How to keep calm in a crisis. Remember the key words. What the dickens are those key words? I'm down about as low as I can get. They ought to be directly over the railroad tracks. If I can't get any lower, we'll smack up. Well, have you got any field glasses in this flying percolator? Yeah, around here somewhere. See if you can spot the train. It shouldn't be too hard. The Eldorado's got a headlight that throws a beam about a half a mile. Yeah, I've got the glasses. I'm watching. Oh, Pat, we're awfully low. Yes, ma'am. If he suddenly spots anything and has to climb to avoid it, we, we might stall, mightn't we? Now just relax, dear. I told you before... You, you see the train? No, no, not yet. Well, you better see it soon, Mr. Abbott. I can't keep this up indefinitely. 
If we come to a very high spot, I may not be able to hedge hop like I'm doing. Well, it should be here, unless it's late. And I don't see a thing. Just miles of track. I can just about make out the tracks. This storm is cutting the visibility down too much. Are you positive you're right about the time and the place? Yes, absolutely. The only thing that could throw us is if that train is very late. That could be. Then we'd have to backtrack. Well, it probably is late with this weather. Now, if you just keep mum, dear, I... Wait a minute, wait. Wait a second, I spotted it. I see it. A streamliner, about 20 cars. There's no freight. This is lit up like a Christmas tree down there. Oh, thank heavens. Now what? Can you get about 10 or 15 miles ahead of her and find a place to sit this plane down? I can try. Oh, my aching GI back. Find a place to sit down here, huh? We've got to, my friend. A scientist with top secret information has been killed. His head was bashed in. Holy Aunt Hannah, is that what yes. this trip... Yes. The killers are on that train. They'll put it down sweet and gentle and make it real fast. If I can see a big enough stretch. This is a very small plane, but that doesn't mean we can land on a dime. You know, I had... Wait a minute. I see a spot. Doesn't look too bad. Because that rain's got so many puddles going, we could land and maybe hit a ditch or a gully or give hole and turn right over. I'll never see it coming. All right, all right. Put it down, pal. Huh? Right where you think we have a chance to make it. Okay, now if I... If I overshoot this field, there's a cliff up ahead there, see? I see. We'll go right off the cliff. Now put it down, I said. Steady. Ginger. Yeah? Brace yourself against that seat. Wish I could see more, but... Uh, here goes. Start praying. Easy, boy. Easy. That's it. Pat, I, I can't look. Easy. This is it. Now. Pat, the cliff. We're too close. We're too close. Oh, you made it. Oh, Rod. <laughs> That's uh, wonderful. Beautiful job. Now, look. You got emergency flares? Yeah, uh, under the seat. Fine, I'll take a few. What in the world are you going to do now? Set these off in the track in front of the El Dorado and hope there isn't an accident. They do 90 miles an hour on some of these stretches. We ran through the rain to the track. The pilot stayed back with his plane and was to join us later. I'll light a flare here, Jean. Just hope the rain doesn't kill it. You hear the train coming? No, not yet. Okay. Put another flare here. There. Now, oh, let's see. Well, there are no curves on this approach. That's good. The engineer will see the flares early. Only it takes him almost a mile to come to a full stop. Yeah. That's it. Now... Just wait and watch. Pat, you need a gun. If you're going to board this train... Yes, I need a lot of things, but I don't have any of them. I just have to take my chances. Good. He's seen it. You keep wide of the track, Jean. Very wide. Yes, I am, dear. He's slowing down. Now, look, when it gets to very slow speed, you watch down the left side. Watch the car doors. Someone might try to sneak off. I'll watch to my right. Shout if you see anything suspicious. Now, she stops, run down a way so you can see more of the train. That's the girl. Now, look for the conductor. Now, don't say anything. Let me do all the talking. Right. There he is. There comes the conductor. Hey, hey, what's up? I set those flares, conductor. Uh, what's the matter? Is this part of washout? What's wrong here? Uh, my name is Abbott, Pat Abbott. This is my wife, Jean. I'm a private detective. We had to stop your train. Uh, why? I want to see a passenger of yours immediately, Professor Duffield. He called you about it on the radio phone, remember? Yeah. Now, I have no time to explain. The crew car, the last one? Yes, now, but wait a minute. You have no right to do this. You've already broken the law. Sitting up flares like that... All right, that, all right. Can... Now, you come with me. There's a murder involved. Any armed police aboard? We could use them. No, and if what you're telling me is a lot of malarkey... Well, let's get I'll on tell... board. Step up, Gene. All right, now. Which compartment is Professor Duffield? Uh, compartment D. Here it is, Pat. Uh, sorry, Conductor, I'm going oh, in. Oh, just a minute, you. You can't just... Yes, what is it? Pat... And it's Charlie. What? Good time, Charlie. Well, what are you doing here? I, I thought you... Thought that we were on our way to New York by now, Charlie? Yes, we might have been. Well, but... Mr. Abbott, there's Professor Duffield. Now, what's all the excitement about? You're talking to Professor Duffield. This man is not Duffield, what? Doctor. Get out of my way. Stay where you are, Charlie. Charlie? This man has been masquerading as Professor Duffield. He murdered the professor. And the blue rocket to Chicago. 
Then he hid the body in the upper berth of his compartment. You don't get out of my way. You left the body in your own compartment. Then you took the professor's face in the Sioux car. All the crews are changed. You told everyone in the Eldorado that you were Duffy. All right, Abbott. If you won't get out of the way. Put down that gun, Everybody, you... out of my way. I'll shoot anybody that tries to follow me. Don't move till I'm off this car. Oh, Pat, how are we stopping? I'll get after him. That flask he took with him may be terribly important. Pat, come back. He'll kill you. He, he's left the train. I can see him through this window. He's running up the hill out there. Pat, don't! The door he sent. Yeah, I got it. Come back, Charlie! I told you not to follow me, Abbott! I said come back. I won't miss this time. Now look out behind you, the cliff. Charlie, grist, gripping the flask, fell 3,000 feet. And turning to fire at Pat, he didn't notice that he was beside that same ominous cliff we almost went over when we were in the plane. Some time later, Pat and I were back on the El Dorado. The conductor and local police were conferring about the crime. Pat and I were having hot coffee in the lounge. Well, Jean, I know exactly what you're going to say. Do you? Yes, you're very upset because I took so many chances. Well, I certainly am. After all these years of married life, I've become rather fond of you, Patrick, and I'd hate I to see... I beg your pardon, Mr. Abbott. Oh. Mrs. Abbott. Oh, hello. I remember you from the Blue Rocket. You're the gentleman who wouldn't play bridge with us. Yes. I think I'd best introduce myself. I am Professor Ernest Duffield. You're... You're what? That is correct. My identification papers. Do you care to see them, Mr. Abbott? Mm-hmm. Yes. They told me what you did. I am extremely grateful. And so I imagine is the government. It is quite simple. The man Charles Drake murdered was hired to impersonate me. I was bitterly opposed to the idea, but the scientists' commission insisted upon it. I pleaded with them, but they wouldn't listen. The chap volunteered for the job, fully realizing how dangerous it was. Well, Professor, your flask is gone. I presume it contains something, uh, something very valuable? It was supposed to contain something valuable, Mr. Abbott. And Mr. Drake went to great pains to find it, but, of course, it was worthless. The flask Mr. Drake died with in his hand was a nickel's worth of colored water. The real flask obviously is being sent to California by other means. And how do we know you're Professor Duffield? I don't like to seem rude or melodramatic, but couldn't those identification papers be a government-manufactured fake for security reasons? Couldn't you be a government agent, maybe, impersonating Duffield, too? Did the government take the chance of revealing who the real man is even now? Did they, Mrs. Abbott? Pat and I finally got back aboard the Blue Rocket on our way to New York. We were alone in our bedroom. Pat, do you realize you haven't kissed me since we left New York three days ago? My, my, that's quite a debt I owe, isn't it? You owe me 228 kisses. Plus interest and carrying charges. A grand total of 343. Wow. I better start paying off, huh? Hmm. Well, you'll find this is a very friendly bank, Mr. Abbott. We wouldn't mind at all if you'd um, overdraw your account. Moral of the story. There are plenty of fast express trains from Chicago to New York. But if you have a handsome husband who likes to make love to you. Don't be a fool. Take a slow train. The National Broadcasting Company has presented The Adventures of the Abbots, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon as those nationally popular personalities of detective fiction, Pat and Jean Abbott, created by Francis Crane. The cast included Kenny Delmar, Louis Van Ruten, and Mandel Kramer. The Adventures of the Abbots was written by Howard Merrill. Original music composed and conducted by Dewey Bergman, produced by Ted Lloyd and Bernard L. Schubert, Directed and recorded by Harry Frazee.
This is Bill Rippey speaking. Next week, same time, same station, another exciting adventure in crime with Pat and Gene in The Adventures of the Abbots. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Welcome back. Well, what an exciting episode of the uh, of the Abbots. Uh, I, I have to say that this was uh, very suspenseful and uh, thrill-packed. And you did begin to see, I think, in the latter part of the 50s, and there are some uh, Johnny Dollar episodes, with Bob Bailey even, that began to deal with uh, the Cold War and the concerns about security and spies. And they, they're they definitely fascinating episodes. And what I think, uh, for uh, good or ill, makes it... Uh, very interesting is a lot of these concerns are applicable uh, to today's uh, world. These aren't new concerns. For example, bioterrorism. We're still hearing about it in the news. We have just have uh, different uh, folks we're concerned about. But the, it's, I guess, some ironic timelessness in the topical nature of the episode. Well, now we turn to listener comments. I uh, got an email here says, I love your show. Nero Wolf and Box 13 have to be my favorites. My daughter loves Sherlock Holmes. I keep looking for an iPhone audiobook version of your book, but have not found it yet. Well, thanks a lot. We have not yet crafted an, uh, uh, an audiobook version of the book. It's, it's a challenging thing. Uh, when I initially sat down to uh, write it, I just figured, you know, talk into a microphone. But I, I ended up not as satisfied with the quality. But one thing is, uh, I, I got a sound recorder for Christmas, and I tried it out at a recent writer's conference, and it actually worked very well at capturing the voice without having to uh, hold the microphone. So I may, uh, I may experiment with that and hope to get that out sometime available in uh, audiobook form. Speaking of books, we have this comment from John says, Hi, Adam, I wanted to let you know that your shows have kept me company through many long nights of writing my new hard-boiled mystery. My blood runs cold. Please keep up the great work. Uh, sincerely, John Castle. Well, thanks so much, John, and best of luck to you on your book when it comes out. Well, that will do it for now. We will be back tomorrow with Nero Wolf, and we'll have an announcement Regarding a change to uh, some of our future programming, we will discuss tomorrow after Nero Wolf. Uh, in the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net and follow us over on Twitter at Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.